So thank you to everyone who's joined us here today for this webinar on the UNESCO's Internet Universality Indicators, the Romex Indicators, and libraries in Sub-Saharan Africa. It's a really great opportunity to hold this webinar. I know that from IFLA headquarters, we've been had the privilege of working closely with UNESCO around these indicators, but we've always had in mind this idea that they offer this fantastic tool, this fantastic um, tool for libraries to be able to think about their contribution to supporting a really inclusive internet, supporting digital inclusion, combating digital divides, both in terms of thinking through their role, but also actually in terms of engaging with governments and actually really making ourselves part of the discussion. There's some really excellent work already taking place in Sub-Saharan Africa. We're incredibly encouraged and lucky to have a very strong regional division committee for Sub-Saharan Africa. I know that we have our, uh, the chair of the committee on the call. Um, that has engaged closely around the Internet Governance Forum. But of course, we want to bring that to more people. And so I'm really honoured and we're really happy today to have two excellent speakers from UNESCO um, who will be talking about the principles, what they are, what they can do, and then really talking about their implementation, experiences of working with them on the ground in order to create communities, to create change, to create insights around what it is that we need to produce a really, really, a really, really, a really, really inclusive, a really successful, ideally, internet for everyone. So our two speakers are, first of all, we have Jean, Dr. Jean Honghu, who is UNESCO's program specialist and global focal point on internet universality. She works within the communication and information sector within UNESCO, and she's an affiliate of the Harvard University Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society. She's also, she's a great friend of IFLA, she, we work very closely with her within the Internet Governance Forum and have worked closely on the Romex principle so far. She's also a fantastic supporter of IFLA within UNESCO, has been very involved, was at her last conference and I know came away extremely positive about the experience and so definitely a very strong friend of libraries and it's great to have her here today. Our other speaker is another great friend of libraries, Simon Ellis. Um, He's an independent consultant, but working alongside UNESCO and has also been utterly instrumental in conceptualizing and actually delivering on the Internet universality indicators, these Romex principles that provide such a fantastic and such a potentially powerful tool for libraries. He brings experience in particular of working around statistics and engaged for a long time with UNESCO Institute, in, Institute Statistics and which is based in Montreal, which is also where he's joining us from. So in particular, I wanted to thank him for joining us at seven o'clock in the morning. Um, it's definitely above and beyond. So that is, 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 is very much appreciated. Um, so Jean Hong is going to talk a little bit about the indicators, their genesis, what they are. Simon will then talk us through how they're being implemented and the lessons and the insights and the progress that it's possible to make in this way. And then I'm very glad to say we have Damalare Oyedele, who's a member of our Sub-Saharan African Regional Division Committee and who has been involved and engaged with Internet Governance Forum activities on behalf of IFLA in the past. And he will be providing commentary at the end of the two presentations and then opening up to the floor. So I hope we can have a good, rich questions and answer session. So with that, I would very much like to hand over to Jan Hong. Over to you. Yes, thank you so much, Stephen. And good morning, everyone online. Although I couldn't see you, but I know you are there. Um, as Stefan mentioned, that uh, I've been working at UNESCO on the digital transformation area, and also I recently took over the management of information for all program. With that, we had uh, more than 20 years a uh, solid partnership with IFLA. Uh, I've been always a supporter at a professional and a personal level of the libraries and the librarians. And your work is super crucial, even more than ever now in the digital era. So uh, I'd like to share my screen now to uh, share our work related to these indicators um, and how we can make it relevant to uh, enhancing the work of libraries. And so I think you can all see my screen. Then we, we, can, we can, we might need to go full screen. That's it. Oh, we, we can see the, the back end. That's it. <laughs> so now you see it, uh, the That's full good. screen. Okay, I always need to do a swap somehow. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> as you can see, the title of my presentation is talking about uh, um, how we 
translate the international principles to actions. I'm using the universality of internet Romex indicator as a living example uh, because um, uh, I believe that the good governance and also the digital development depends on uh, a very much uh, good evidence to be collected and evidence-based uh, policy making as same for the libraries. Um, before that, I just briefly introduce our program. I mean, you know, Stefan know it better than me. I think I've been working with us uh, before I came in. Essentially, the Information for All program uh, aims to support the member states and stakeholders, including librarians, to achieve the goals in six areas. As you can see, information for development, information literacy, information preservation, information ethics, information accessibility, and the multilingualism in cyberspace. I think the library and librarian, your work really cross cut to all the six areas. Um, not only uh, Romex indicators framework, IFAP supports all types of the uh, evidence frameworks to measure the digital transformation to support the role of each stakeholder in this uh, digital society, uh, such as um, uh, SDG 1610.2 on the access to information. Again, library has a huge role here and the UNESCO has develop all sorts of media information literacy uh, development uh, frameworks as well. And the other sister agencies such as UNDESA, they have a long-term uh, e-government survey uh, at a national and also local level. And ITU, uh, you must have known they have been measuring the digital access scales, meaningful connectivity, et cetera. And not only uh, UN agencies, but also those uh, non-governmental partners, NGOs, research institutes such as SIDIC, uh, our category two uh, regional center of UNESCO based in Brazil, and uh, the Global Digital Inclusion Partnership and Alliance for Affordable Internet. I mean, I mean so many actors in this field. I also encourage, encourage our uh, library uh, committee, IFLA, uh, our annual conference can engage with those uh, actors in this area it can be useful. <clears throat> so uh, coming back to uh, the uh, objective of today's pre presentation, let's focus on Internet Universality Rome framework. Essentially, it came from the four pillar principles UNESCO's 195 member states have endorsed back in 2015. Uh, the firm principle UNESCO believe most important to govern and guide the development of digital transformation are, as you can see, uh, human rights, which is R, uh, open access by all, and the multi-stakeholder participation, we call it Rome. And in order to give teeth to these four international principles uh, recognized by all the member states, we put in place a number of uh, 300 indicators as in this uh, publication, you can all download it from the website, it's available in eight languages to, to essentially operationalize these four broad principles into practice. So each country, each stakeholder can identify the achievements and the gaps uh, you have you have achieved at the national level, and also to to know what uh, should what has been missing, what should be improved. If I unpack a bit on this package of the three hundred indicators, we have identified one hundred nine core indicators, which are mostly uh, used by most countries under assessment because uh, one hundred nine indicators are still covering all the five categories. Uh, to give you a holistic picture about how uh, human rights open access by all and the multi stakeholder participation, as well as a number of cross cutting issues are being uh, implemented at national level. Um, leverage, again, is a cross cutting uh, factor uh, in all these five categories. You can see um, library certainly you are enabling all the human rights as measured here, without a library, we don't know how free expression, uh, freedom of information, freedom association, social economic rights would be able to fulfill for many countries. 
and the internal openness again library is so instrumental to facilitate access to open content, open data, and open governance uh, in uh, through uh, through your services. And in terms of access, <clears throat> more than ever, library uh, are playing a role, crucial role to enabling meaningful access and meaningful uh, connectivity to have the inclusive participation, inclusive access to information by women, by, by youth, children, by the people with disabilities, and also to access those local contents uh, through the local language. Uh, with the media information literacy, digital competence be reinforced uh, through the libraries. On the multi stakeholder participation, that's something I have observed that uh, perhaps libraries and librarians should be more engaging in this global and national policy discussions. I think Stefan has done model work. I mean, you have been so proactive in shaping and joining the discussions over IGF, over OASIS. I think we need more people like you from the your community to really make the uh, library and the uh, librarians on the more visible on the uh, agenda of global development and also national agenda. Um, the lastly, um, in, in today, I mean, AI is so pervasive and the generative AI is so disruptive and the uh, ethics issue became so prominent. Uh, I have seen the draft program of this year's uh, annual conference, WIC in, in, in Rotterdam. Uh, I'm so happy to see a number of uh, sessions dedicated to the issues of artificial intelligence. I will also present some work of UNESCO to support this uh, very meaningful discussion. <clears throat> so far, I mean, since we have uh, launched the indicators in 2018, uh, in four years, the genomics indicators were well adopted by many countries who think they are relevant, particularly in Africa. Among 44 countries under assessment, we have uh, Africa leading the entire assessment. You have 17 countries. Uh, already undergoing the assessment, and uh, se several of them already completed, such as Benin, Senegal, uh, Kenya, I think Ghana, is, uh, Ethiopia already fin finished the report, which will be published. Um, we are support, we're also um, scaling up the assessment in Africa. We want to have the, all African countries to be assessed before uh, the 2030 developed agenda. That's a goal. I also count on your support. If any of you uh, online, you found this indicator interesting, relevant to your country, and your country has not yet uh, taken up the assessment, you can definitely contact me, contact Stefan. We can liaise with you to leverage resources to, to provide our support to the initial new project. I think um, a library and librarians can also take leadership and trigger this kind of digital project in your country. Uh, essentially, you are, you are so important in this process. Uh, I also encourage you to download the published reports uh, on our website so you can have a more uh, close idea of what has been assessed, what past recommendations have, have emerged. Many of them are really uh, targeting the, the libraries and related to the work you are doing. I think uh, Stefan has done a wonderful uh, a research and not published article. <laughs> I always quote it. You have looked into the past recommendations to to, to uh, compile and analyze that uh, how libraries and the libraries are are being uh, are being informed through this national assessment. So I think that should be uh, that experience should be expanded. Not only we should encourage the ongoing and the future assessment of genomics to to be sensitive to the role of uh, libraries because some countries they may have forgotten to give recommendations and also. And the forthcoming uh, new assessment, and also we have a new process to update these indicators. They have been already there for almost five years. We need to review what indicators should be added, what the, all the indicators should be deleted. I think the um, library uh, is definitely an uh, area I think should be enhanced in this uh, in this framework. 
Then my slides will just shed light on the uh, recommendations emerged from those countries uh, already assessed. Uh, as I mentioned that uh, before, we are measuring five categories of indicators. So um, policy recommendation will also emerge from these five categories. As you can see, we have seen a number of very strong human rights-based uh, recommendations from those countries. I can share my uh, my my slides afterwards. I mean, even in, I'm mean, in Germany. You can see how pioneer they are. They have uh, recommended the right to internet access as a new human right because now this without the internet access, you wouldn't be able to um, participate in a democracy and many other even daily life. And in some other countries, the privacy. And the data protection is a focus area. Uh, either they don't have strong uh, protection by law of privacy and data, or they have a law, but they are lack of the enforcement and the independent um, functional authority to enact uh, the law. Uh, same, I think that uh, many African countries share the same challenges. And not only on human rights, the uh, all the national reports also lead to uh, comprehensively uh, recommendations in different areas, uh, like in universal access to the innovation and to uh, uh, to the to the equitable uh, connectivity is and now even the multi-stakeholder participation part. Uh, in some countries, there are lack of a sustainable mechanism to involve. Uh, people from different sectors in the policymaking discussion. Um, uh, one common uh, shared challenge we have observed is the lack of uh, data uh, on internet, on uh, digital transformation. So one uh, general recommendation we observed uh, uh, in many countries that to reinforce the data collection and uh, uh, internet observatories and the national statistics capacity uh, to start to uh, collect uh, all the information data rates, the how people are using internet, how the internet uh, companies uh, are performing in the country. I think that uh, in this, uh, on this aspect, I also perceive a library has uh, such a role to play. Uh, you, I mean, you have a huge role to play to uh, to um, to reinforce the archives, the the data information related journals related to the internet uh, survey uh, data and research, etc. Um, and so far, I mean, with so many uh, recommendations uh, emerged, we, we don't guarantee everything will be uh, realized into reality, uh, but we have um, perceived a very positive and progressive impact happening um, after our assessment, such as uh, in Germany, the assessment recommend has been uh, proposed to the parliament, to the digital uh, committee many times, and as those topics recommend the already reflect in their new uh, coalition treaty governing the development of the country in the forthcoming a few years. And also in Brazil, we see clearly after as assessment, the, the National Council of Data Pro Protection has been uh, created and also reinforced. Same for, for other countries like Senegal. Uh, I mean, in March, their national ministry came to uh, UNESCO. I heard literally from her that they have established a, a new uh, internet uh, uh, observatory to collect the data for the country. So that's uh, all I can share for now. Uh, I have my uh, international advisor on the project, uh, Mr. Simon Ellis, uh, who really gets connected to every national country who's doing the assessment, uh, following them on each step from uh, uh, composing the multi-stakeholder advisory board to research a team to review their draft report, uh, final report to attending their uh, validation workshop. He really knows the best on all the national operations and also even the following up because the completion of the assessment is not the end, it's actually a new start because all our aiming to do is to make changes. So I, I also look forward to hear what um, uh, Simon will say. And also I look forward to having more interaction and the question answer with you. Thank you. Thank you so thank you so much, Shan Hong, for and obviously for all the kind words. But I think it's it's really impressive, and it's I've been trying to tweet this at the same time. I think that point about the impact 
that, that that the application of the application of these indicators having in terms of shaping policies and enabling governments to think differently about how to govern the internet, how to make the internet work for people for inclusion, is is a really and it's a strong argument. It's a strong call on libraries to get involved because this is something that can that really can make a difference. So, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Simon. Thank you, Stephen. Um, I'm going to I'm not going to have slides, but I'm going to stick a couple of books in front of my face so that maybe you can see them there. It's about 10 years since I worked on this with ISLA publication on library statistics for the 21st century with Michael Heaney, Ross Riverpole, and uh, uh, Pierre Meunier. And I spoke in the global ISLA conference in South Africa at Stellenbosch and also in uh, um, the library conference in Montreal. And, and in a way, it's a good point to ask, well, what has happened? We, we produced this standard for statistics and measuring libraries, and the library role continues to evolve. And at the same time, there are still problems in putting together library statistics. Um, however, for me, what that working on, on libraries taught me is that the library is the central point for local communities to access public information it, it, it and services. And so in many communities, especially rural areas, libraries have a central role in local areas. And I think this is um, absolutely uh, key. And in many ways, uh, even at that time, I used to think that library is not really the right word to describe what you do, because it's not, I mean, it, it is about books and um, I'm a great lover of books. I always have half a dozen books I'm reading, but it's not, it, it's no longer just about books. It is that central point of information. And the librarian's role is to help people find that information. Um, and this goes into the core role of the information for all group in, in, in Paris as well. You know, the core role of the librarian is to help people find the information that they are looking for. Or in, it may be um, simply books, it may be uh, uh, novels and, and stories, but it, it's often um, public information, how to fill your tax form, how to get a driving license, all those kinds of things. Um, so Romex and the internet universality, as, as Shan Hong says, has now happened in about 44 countries. And libraries, I can't say that libraries it, it appear explicitly very much in the reports that are there. There are two or three indicators, I would say, where libraries are explicitly there. So um, in the indicators, we explicitly ask about internet access points and libraries are still one of the internet access points. I mean, it's, it's a, a, a given as it were, and that is one of the things that's changed that in Africa now, it's a mobile phone based internet access. But nonetheless, if you have trouble um, access the internet, if you have trouble finding things on the internet, the local library is a good place to go to help get that um, help. Um, and then uh, um, the second place it comes in is in the, the use of services. So we are asking um, what kind of things people use the internet for. And a lot of the services that are there, um, including, uh, um, you know, as I said, getting government information, filling out forms, but also finding training opportunities, those kind of things. It's a natural for people to go through the library to look for that kind of thing. Um, and uh, librarians can often help, therefore, in, in finding and letting people know whether training appropriate uh, opportunities that they see on the internet are um, appropriate for them. And in today's world, probably even whether they are real. Um, so um, I would say in, in summary, I think a library is a place where Romex is seen to be observed and practiced. So as Shan Hong again has said, um, uh, a library is where um, rights, people can find out about their rights, where they can um, practice their rights and get support in helping see that. It should be open, it's open to all, but it's also, is its resources are open and it um, allows people access to all sorts. It may even, if you like, be the institution which does open the resources. Um, which people may otherwise find closed. And that also takes me to one of the key points in Africa, of course, 
As we know in Africa, one of the big issues in local rural areas is the issue of gatekeepers. Um, and often the gatekeepers charge for their services to have the tax form filled out. Librarians have this public ethos and public access, and therefore um, a library is a good point to go where the gatekeeper is, is a, an open function and not something which is used to as a, as a power over local villages. Um, uh, access is obvious, universal access is key to all of this and remains a particular problem in Africa. And while, for example, people use mobile phones, I mean, I've worked for the last three years in Liberia and huge issues of communication and, of course, electricity. And it's possible that while there may not be electricity in the houses, if there is a local community library, it will have both the electricity supply and perhaps the uh, signal, a better signal to enable access to, to all these services. Um, and the multi-stakeholder, again, uh, it is pretty clear. Um, libraries are a community facility and they are there to bring together the community in this multi-stakeholder um, uh, uh, position. So as I said, I repeat, I think um, libraries are um, a place where Romex happens, where the principles of Romex are put in place and where they're practiced. Um, and also, as Shan Honga said, as a statistics person as well, I have to say that I do think they are a good place for a collection of data. Um, often uh, countries carry out these surveys and they will send uh, data collection interviewers around to local communities. But librarians usually know uh, uh, um, about statistics, about the ways to collect data, about the way to compile data in a systematic fashion. And they, they understand their local communities better than anybody else, librarians and school teachers. And of course, the, the, the overlap between schools and libraries is often a, a, a key one here. Um, it, in the last big thing I want to say is that I want to also introduce a, a second UNESCO program that I've been working on um, and which in which libraries uh, um, also feature. So this is my next uh, uh, book. So this is Culture 2030 and to so look at culture within the 2030 agenda. And here um, um, I was explicitly involved in setting the standard and we've been able to uh, include the IFLA standard, the previous 2009 standard I worked on, into these indicators. This means that the indicators collected under to Culture 2030 fit in with those collected under IFLA. Um, so we include uh, um, uh, visits and visitors, of course, who are not the same thing. Um, one person does several visits, but we want to see as many visitors as possible. Um, uh, the count of, of libraries, the seating, the floor area, and the distribution across the country. So, and from that, for example, quite quickly, I can say within, we've only had 10 pilot countries here, um, but we have so, seen that um, the library is the most evenly distributed cultural institution. And it's found in more districts. All the other cultural facilities tend to be concentrated in, uh, especially in Africa, in big cities. But libraries, even if it's a donkey library or a, a horseback library or a mobile car based library um, and it's moving around, it's there. Um, and, uh, um, and that's particularly it's a, also a key uh, opportunity and a, a key demonstration of how important libraries are. Um, and of course, libraries are often, in culture terms, uh, 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 again, a multifunction institution. The library can be the museum, it can be the school, it can be the uh, performance area, um, and it can be just the community meeting place. Um, so again, um, libraries have a core role uh, um, in there, both information, education, um, for, for all aspects of UNESCO's activity. Um, and then the last kind of little message that I think is a nice one is that the, the pilot countries also show that libraries have probably been the most resilient um, uh, institution under COVID. Um, now, this may be because um, increasingly libraries are able to make electronic loans and e-books, but I suspect it's also about, it, it seems to me to be also about actual physical number of visitors. 
Um, so that speaks to the fact that um, while people could refrain or, or, or um, are not able to uh, carry out many activities under COVID, the one thing they most desperately wanted more than anything else was to get to the library. Um, so I think that's a, 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 a important, an important uh, observation too. So to, to sum up in a way, um, libraries under Romex are, are about this question, internet delivery. And undoubtedly, as I've almost said to start with, um, the internet is the future for libraries. And this access point to all sorts of information, I think is very much the key role that libraries have to play. And, and as Culture 2030 shows the libraries as a cultural institution, Romex looks at the service delivery and the principles that libraries stand for, and culture indicators look at the library as an institution. And therefore, um, as an institution, again, um, it, has a heart, uh, uh, it has been more resilient than others during COVID and, and has a key role in local groups. Um, so I, I, in, in all of that, what we're saying here is that um, I hope that libraries will emerge um, in UNESCO policy um, across the different dimensions of, of UNESCO policy. I think information for all is core because the information for all exemplifies precisely, I think, the role that um, um, libraries play in all its aspects. But I think it has a role in all sectors. And I hope, for example, that as time goes on and we get more countries, both in the internet indicators and in the culture indicators, we can present a holistic picture of libraries um, in society um, and, for example, follow that through, for example, into the education sector as well. Um, um, and uh, um, increasingly in the education goals, um, people are, the world is moving to look at um, the post-secondary and adult education, as well as the, uh, um, uh, uh, as well as the school aspect. So thank you very much. I, I was, it was a great opportunity. Uh, I really hope this goes forward. And I, um, as Shan Hong, I'm a, a, a terrific believer in both libraries and IFLA. So thank you very much, Stephen. Thank, thank you, thank you very much, and uh, for all of the compliments, that if for all of the compliments about live support, we agree with them, <laughs> as, as you'd imagine. But it, it, it's so great to know that we have such strong allies, and I promise also, especially on the library statistics work, that's obviously also fed into our library map of the world, which aims to be a, a source of data at the global level. But there's some really fantastic work going on at within the with at the subnational level, looking at spread, looking at tools. So, I'm very happy now to hand over to Damilare as our sort of lead respondent in order to give some initial reactions, to ask questions, and then to open the floor to our other participants. Damilare. Yeah, thank you so much, Stephen, for setting the scene for this conversation. And thank you so much, Jan Horn and Simon, uh, for this insightful uh, presentation. I believe our audience have questions. If you have questions, please feel free to try to type them in the chat box and I'll respond to them. However, as we wait for our audience, our love to just bringing some comments and questions also uh, where Simon and AMG, the library's uh, internet access points. Uh, this could not that, okay, if, if libraries are connected, the communities are also connected to access to internet, okay? Now, looking at the Romex principle itself, and this question goes to uh, both of the speakers, uh, how do we as libraries engage in the process of the evaluation process? And who are we gonna be working with to make this possible? And what is the time frame for this to happen? And uh, with the ongoing process, how can libraries be part of this uh, to have libraries captured in subsequent reporting? May, may I uh, thank you for uh, thank you, Damian, for this question. Um, I think uh, Simon can add uh, after I give some answers. Um, I also want to combine this question to what I just answered on the Q and A on the in the chat. And uh, a colleague, I mean, Ayo Della Longe. Um, he kind of offer uh, his volunteer services to conduct the national assessment um, of Romics in Nigeria. I think that might be maybe a general question. Uh, given the time limit, I didn't present the methodology and process in there. So I just uh, like to share my screen again to show we have a slide focus on this process. I give you an idea what you need to do, and how long, how much take, and how we can work with you. So I, if you allow me to share screen again. Okay. 
Okay, so you see my screen, how uh, Romics assessment assessed at the national level. <coughs> Let me swap again. So I believe <coughs> you can see it clearly. Essentially, there are eight steps. Um, if you perceive, first of all, if you pro Okay, above all, uh, it's a voluntary assessment. So we are not imposing, and that's not for competition, for comparison. It's really uh, based on your, uh, your national will uh, and this consensus of the stakeholders. If you perceive that this assessment is useful, relevant to our country, we can use to do strategize our national policies on digital transformation on internet and on libraries. Uh, you, you see a need usefulness, you can start to think about the weather uh, if you could really take on it. it it's a big uh, commitment, definitely. So, so normally we, we need to have a consensus and the expression of interest from key stakeholders from the national state, uh, whether you are a library or if, if you, you can also liaise with your um, Ministry of Information, Ministry of ICT, that the key uh, key actors of digital policies in the country. Uh, uh, we are ready to receive your expression of interest, whether from you or from your government. Uh, if you, if not from a government, we also help you to liaise because we are intergovernmental program, intergovernmental organization can help uh, the, to trigger the discussion among the different st stakeholders in the country to have the uh, agreement and a consensus that um, country of Nigeria will need this assessment, so then we can go forward. So the ones, uh, so a uh, uh, month before we uh, technically start, start the process, we need this uh, critical consensus to be reached uh, through dialogue, through maybe also with UNESCO involving, we have to the office or whatever, but the most important to, to express your interest at the first step. So once we have all the everybody on board agreed to do something, so in terms of methodology, you will start this a step First, uh, we establish a multi-stakeholder advisory board for, for the country. Okay, let's take Nigeria, for example. Uh, we need you uh, compose um, uh, maybe uh, 10 to uh, 20 people's uh, board consisting the representative from uh, ministries, different um, governments, agencies related, even parliaments, and also uh, the representative from your uh, industry, the private sector. And um, certainly the representative from the NGO and also from these agencies like uh, libraries from, uh, um, from different uh, stakeholders who all have a say in, in shaping digital policies to, to they, 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 they serve on the board in their personal capacity, although they might represent in different uh, uh, agencies, because the idea of this advisory board is to provide the scientific guidance of the entire uh, assessment, also to help provide the data, et cetera, uh, to work with the collaborative uh, research team, but really respect the independence of research team and to make sure the results of assessment is a neutral objective. The first one is to have this MAB in place. Second thing, uh, we need to build up a research team. As you see, Romix encompassed the expertise of five different distinct areas. You need the experts on human rights, you need the uh, experts on access. Uh, otherwise, the research uh, wouldn't be uh, so uh, comprehensive and insightful. I think, uh, I think Simon knows better on, on this part. And uh, the, as I mentioned, this research team will work together with the multi stakeholder advisory board, and they really conduct the, the data collection assessment and also uh, draft the recommendations in a very independent manner to make sure it reflects the real picture. Um, and then the uh, action uh, number three, four, five, uh, six, they are all the work to be done by the research team. And also we encourage the research team will share their methodology, share their plan their initial draft uh, uh, with the MAB for consultation, make sure they didn't miss any big picture, they, they didn't they, make sure they can get the data they can, they can receive. So it has worked very well in many other countries. They work uh, in a very mutually supportive manner, um, but, I'm not, but I'm not evident because uh, some countries my lack of the uh, experience of multi-stakeholder participation. So 
So we also need some training. And for this training, capacity building, and Simon and I will also have uh, conduct many workshops before. We can also help you uh, to show you, uh, to make you orient to each step of this process. Then when you reach the point that you have completed the research and assessment, have a draft report, recommendations formulated, you have to put in place uh, by organizing a national validation workshop. It means to have a national level event to invite uh, all the stakeholders, not limited to the MAB members, but to expand uh, the, the participation to all the related actors in the country to read this draft report and also to trigger debates on the policy recommendations to agree on the most important uh, actions to take uh, emerging from, from this uh, building on assessment uh, conducted. Uh, if uh, this is successful, which means uh, the, the uh, national assessment uh, uh, report and the recommendation has been have been eventually endorsed by all the national stakeholders through this conference, and we could um, publish the the report, and also on a condition that the report is really written in a level uh, which reaches the quality requirement by UNESCO. <clears throat> oh, my colleague. Uh, Simon is also the one who help us to um, make sure of the quality control over over the of the report. So after the national validation workshop, we more or less finished the research, and then we will I mean mention that we encourage the and maybe continue to exist that will help to uh, put in action of those recommendations. And at UNESCO level, we also uh, follow up with you to assess the impact and the monitoring the follow up. And uh, for each country, we are also encouraging you not only just take a picture, but also make a film. As my director, I always make a, like to use, for example, I mean, maybe after a, a few years of the first assessment, you put in place the secondary uh, follow-up assessment to see what has happened, what has been changing, changing what needs to be done more, because the process really uh, is, is a, is a uh, it's a rolling uh, process. Um, so that's um, technically uh, the A-step methodology. Um, and that from the aspect of the project management, I mean, I've managed these this 44 countries. In terms of timeline, I have observed that, that really varies a lot uh, among countries. Um, you can see um, the, the fastest uh, process conducted in Germany, the once they secured the, the consensus and the funding, the conduct assessment in four months. Essentially, it's, um, it's a research to answer 109 questions. It's not a com that complicated. So they have a strong team and they deliver a report in four months. So we publish a report after six months. It's um, uh, the final report is done in, in six months. That's the fastest, but uh, in most countries, it's quite a, um, lengthy because it took a lot of time to compose the MAB. Then it took time to commission and identify the research team. And in many countries in Africa, you have difficulty even to identify the qualified researchers in your country. At, at some point, we need to uh, channel in the international expert to help. And then also funding is another challenge. Of course, UNESCO will help you on that Fund fundraising, but sometimes we also need some contribution in kind from the national ministry to support the organization of the validation workshop, for example. So this all take time, and then we see the report. The quality report can be uh, can be having a big space to improve. So um, Simon has reviewed many reports. We need we will provide a lot of comments and for for revising and also take time. So in most countries, I would say you have to plan for 12 months to 18 months, so one year and a half will be the average timeline you should uh, think about. And lastly, on the um, budget and on the cost side, I also perceive that it's getting increased at the very beginning in some smaller or countries in Africa, we can manage to have uh, 10,000 US dollar. Uh, but now I think so on average, it should cost uh, 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 among uh, 25 to 35,000 US dollars because you literally need to pay uh, to commission the researchers uh, um, to 
um, to compose the MAB, although we don't pay the members of our MAB, the convening meetings uh, can also uh, implicate some uh, cost. And um, now we also uh, budget the national validation workshop in because in some other countries, you know, we couldn't fund the contribution in kind. So we still need another 10,000 for organizing the validation workshop. And then the report will be published by UNESCO. That, that, that cost will normally bear by UNESCO. But still, uh, we need to have a larger uh, budget because, uh, as I mentioned, we want to have some actions to take after the report is uh, published. We want to organize some follow-up for implementation workshops, activities, etc. So if we can put another 20000 I mean, maybe around $50,000, we can have the both assessment and also have some actions to uh, to um, to put in place actions to real to, to translate the re recommendation to action to to achieve some changes. So I would say we need to, um, we need a bigger budget. But uh, to uh, to uh, to start the assessment, I think um, twenty thirty thousand will be sufficient. But if you have a longer term uh, plan, also want to put some actions after the assessment, I think maybe we can budget for forty fifty thousand dollars. Um, yeah, so that's what I can share uh, for uh, initiating and conducting the national assessment process. Perhaps, um, perhaps Simon, do you like do you have anything to add? Yeah, thanks, thanks, Shang Hong. I mean, that, I think it's then make it sound very scary. <laughs> it's um, but but firstly, I I feel that um, as I said, I think libraries have a play a part to play in all of this anyway. Um, Normally, the assessments are carried out by some kind of research agency. Um, it, it can be uh, um, not, not usually directly part of government, but it may be a government research agency. Um, but, and, and then although, like I say, it sounds like it's a lot of resources, we can say that um, many West African countries, for example, have substantially completed their assessments. Um, and uh, as we know, um, unfortunately, uh, many West African countries are not amongst the richest countries in Africa. Uh, yesterday, I took part in the launch workshop of the uh, assessment for Namibia, which was an excellent workshop in which senior uh, ministerial people came along and were very open about what what they wanted, where, what was needed, where they needed to go, and about the problems that they're facing. And they also put it in the context of SADC um, and the Southern African countries to see the alignment with uh, um, broader African policy on, on many of the issues concerned. So I definitely think libra libraries have to play here. I mean, and it would be possible, I would say, that a, a, a national library working with a ministry um, could very well, or a national library network with a, working with a ministry could envisage uh, putting in place a, a, an assessment. Um, and, uh, and there would be a certain need for external funding, um, but that, that is, is, would be possible, I think, within the, the, the various systems that are around for that, from, from UNDP to uh, AU, and, and, and maybe if SADAC becomes more interested, um, something like that. Um, the, other, the other thing I wanted to say, which, which is kind of at the back of what I was saying before, is that it, it's not just about having this national assessment. I think in many ways, um, Romex and Information for All are at the core of every library function. And, and so I think it's worth uh, librarians having a look at this assessment, not just in terms of, of conducting a big national exercise, but looking at how they, the, the library functions and how the library runs. Um, and uh, um, just lost my, lost my train of thought for a moment there. Um, well, I'll I'll stop there. No doubt, if the the idea I was further going on to will come back to me. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Shan Hong and Simon. Uh, my next question uh, is is like a two in one question uh, to further understand how libraries can can further engage. Okay, uh, does the current process of uh, bringing new and suppressing actors to be part of the process now that they have commenced uh, the, the the process of development? Okay, and also does it further enables uh, you know building up around this assessment on the long run and allowing longer time for collaboration? Right, and diving into the context of can libraries 
uh, just approach government to ask them to do this. Okay, what about countries where the work are underway, but libraries aren't involved yet? Uh, what are your take on this? Um, so, so suggesting areas where countries where, where libraries are less involved with the government? Okay. Um, I, I think it, it, it will depend as well on, on the strength of the library association. Um, you know, maybe this is linked to the development of IFLA policy in, in terms of bringing libraries together at the national level. Um, but I think a, a strong motion, for example, from IFLA, the national context, already gives a strong message about uh, um, how important this is. And it would also, from, from the UNESCO perspective, I suspect that it, it would be very good to see library associations um, presenting to their relevant ministries or to the Minister of Education if they, they come through schools, um, that, that, the, that how important it would and how useful it would be um, for, for this kind of assessment to take place. Uh, and that will then uh, um, encourage the ministry to, to at least to, to look at the possibility and to approach UNESCO and to understand uh, um, what would be needed. Chan Hong, do you? Uh, yeah, I, think I agree with everything you said, but also I'd like to uh, inform that, you know, perhaps the latest uh, uh, IFLA UNESCO manifest public library can be a very strong instrument for you to achieve that because it's not only endorsed by, by IFAB uh, Bureau, it was also recently last week uh, endorsed by the IFAB Council and also we are planning to submit to the UNESCO General Conference. It will be really a, a globally recognized instrument and uh, that has set out a very bold and uh, relevant uh, uh, mandates and role of libraries in, in all areas, not only access to information, but also education, uh, culture, uh, expressions, uh, human rights. And so uh, it, 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 it's so uh, compelling messages and also they suggest actions as well. Perhaps the, the, the full flight operation, oper, operationalization of that manifesto can be a very useful approach to have the library and more highlighted in, in, the, in the national strategy. And also so on a global agenda. Brilliant. Thank you so much, uh, Simeon and Shangyun. We have two more questions, right? I would direct one to Simon and one to you, uh, Shangyun. The first question here, which, which goes to Simeon is, uh, why has there been so much take up in African countries, okay? And how can we draw on any of these conclusions to improve going forward and see how libraries can be engaged? And the second question I have, which I would love to direct to Shangyun is that, uh, could we possibly have specific reports uh, for libraries for countries that have been done already, right? Uh, to not get a trajectory towards working with the multi stakeholder group, a advisory board in various countries to work on new reports with them as they progress a little forward. Simon. Thank, thank you, Damila. I, I, I think it, in Africa, we've had a, a number of opportunities, and, and in West Africa, it has worked through the Subnational uh, uh, groups, uh, the, the regional groups, and I think uh, Shanghong's best place to, to, to comment on that. Um, I, I, one of the things I, I I remember what I was going to say last time. Um, we, we tend to look at when you look at the assessment and you see three hundred indicators or, or hundred indicators of the core. Again, it it, it gives you. Uh, um, it's a bit scary to start with, let's say. Um, but it's also important to remember those indicators are questions. So it's a question about, for example, um, how do businesses perceive using the internet? How do children perceive the internet? So the answers there are not the kind of things that you have to um, um, get a lot of money to carry out a big research on. If you have the appropriate people together, um, then uh, that was, um, is good. And at the Namibia meeting yesterday, for example, two very impressive speakers were, were somebody from Minister of Justice who was in response to the question in the Internet Indicators, which is about have the, just, ju have the judges and lawyers had training in Internet rights. He said, well, quite openly, well, no, they haven't, which is what you'd expect in a way from most countries. But the fact that he said that in open meeting was, was very impressive. And at the same time, there's an inspector of police there who um, just said openly, well, 
just a few moments ago, I had a call about some uh, uh, a person who, a woman who had been harassed online and had been, uh, a, a, a scam had been uh, put forward to her and she reported it to the police. Uh, and again, that's also the kind of thing that is, that is in the indicators. So um, it's, a, it's a very wide range of issues. Um, so, so again, for, for African countries, I, I, I guess I would say um, these issues seem particularly relevant. Um, also important here, this is not the kind of thing where we're seeking to, where UNESCO is seeking to rank countries in some huge global index and say, this country's at the top, this country's at the bottom. As, as I say, the, the, the indicators in the form of questions, and it, it's really in that sense, something for the country specific. So you go in depth with the indicator to really see what the situation is inside the country. But at the same time, you've got that UNESCO and IFLA, if you like, standard of, of measurement and of, uh, of, uh, um, of standards, which allows you to see that this is something which is control, which is a, a neutral um, uh, uh, evidence-based statement and not just a, a polemic of some kind. Thank you. Yes, and um, perhaps also tackle a bit on the first question on Africa thing, because yes, I agree with all of you that uh, uh, we have a tremendous number of countries in Africa, but only 17 uh, taking an assessment. Uh, I fully believe in every African country needs it, it's relevant, not only because um, Africa is in the, um, it's, it's being challenged by digital divide, you need to harness the potential of uh, digital technology for development, but also because you are, you have lag behind, uh, not only on internet, but on entire artificial intelligence, all the, the force, uh, uh, industry, also because you need that especially to protect yourself, to, to mitigate the risks, uh, which can um, make an African country to a victim position because other countries, other countries are really developing internet, uh, developing AI, which will count on Africa to be a continent to provide data to as a, as a, as a subject. So you, know, you need to be informed to know systematically uh, what a future, what a potential risk you might face in, in working with external world in the digital area. So I think every African country should need to have this uh, uh, digital assessment to make sure the country's policy regulation framework uh, the different institutions, you have the enough knowledge and so you follow up uh, the, the, the latest development of the global digital uh, transformation. So we can prevent you from lagging behind further even. So, and so uh, but why we only have the 17, that's uh, there are many reasons. Uh, and the lack of uh, uh, advocacy, the lack of uh, national political will, because some national governments they might have some other concerns with this assessment. Uh, Put the country in um, uh, the image in the in a risk, or if they have or maybe the issue of capacity resources, and uh, many many reasons. But uh, that's why we think we need uh, really uh, everybody support, including from library. I'm so happy that to see this uh, the, the reaction from all of you because I never thought that. Uh, well, this uh, very digital product can also be uh, embraced by Stefan by you or uh, so well. You are, you immediately got it. Um, uh, so, so more synergy and uh, at UNESCO level, I, I can make sure that we are really, we have a team here to, to follow up and support on the resource and the methodology and everything. But uh, the real change came from inside. It's really from each of you. If you have a will, you think it's necessary, really liaise with the people you know, with other stakeholders and, um, uh, and also contact us so we can really eventually make the change to happen, make the, to take the initiative. So that's on the, on the issue of Af Africa. And the second thing on the labyrinth engagement, I would say as, um, as Simon mentioned that uh, firstly, uh, the lack of, um, uh, on the library issue on, in the framework. In the 300 indicators, only two, a uh, couple of them, uh, which is relevant to the libraries. Because when we developed uh, in, uh, the indicators, I conducted two years uh, consultations. 
uh, to my memory, we had uh, maybe none or very little participation from the library community. We didn't consult with you at the time, and then say, no wonder we don't have the indicators dedicated to library and, uh, and librarians work uh, in this genomic indicators. So, um, so what can be improved is that, uh, as I mentioned, we are starting a new process of updating these uh, indicators. I will call upon uh, you to join this process, get your voices heard have some dedicated indicators about the libraries in the new indicators. And the second thing that uh, in the, um, the national implementation process, I also observed a very few, maybe zero participation of the library and the librarians in the national multi-stakeholder advisory board. Uh, again, your committee is sort of uh, forgotten in the national assessment. Uh, I think we have a shared responsibility to make sure that in the new assessments, uh, uh, initially in the new countries, we should have the library in the uh, advisory board. And also we can even, we should also even ensure the experts in the library be a part of the research team uh, to make sure that uh, the assessment in the digital ecosystem will shed light on how library libraries are being performing, how they have been, they should be reinforced in this digital, into the digital transformation process to, to have that to be flagged in the national digital policy. So I think we have a lot of work to do that we have started. I also like to pay tribute to Stefan. Thank you for, for being an um, uh, advocate for Rome and thank you for being a bridge between this digital uh, debates with the library uh, library community. Uh, also, if we're looking ahead of the, the, the entire UN's initiative, uh, we are in the middle or almost final to develop the global digital compact within the uh, agenda. Uh, I think uh, IFRA has already coordinated the inputs re representing the library to be reflected in the global digital compact, even not in the text, but maybe in the policy area. I think that's already be a big achievement to get the attention of the policymakers at all levels. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and I, I, I think we, we certainly look forward to taking part in that next stage. It's a fantastic invitation. It's an absolute pleasure working with UNESCO on this. And I think it, it always feels to me in, in, in debates around the internet, we so often take a technology first approach that we take the technology and think, um, what is it that we can achieve with this technology? It's so important actually to start by thinking, well, what are the goals that we have and then apply technology to achieve those goals that we've set out. And so this emphasis on internet universality and those key values, those key missions that are in there within the Romex principles, I think provides a really healthy way of looking at things. I think it provides a, a more inclusive way of looking at things. It provides a way of actually placing internet governance, integrating internet governance discussions more effectively within those wider debates. So we don't just end up with an overly narrow focus that in the end, we risk having a dialogue disorder, sort of passing like ships in the night, just to mix up my language metaphors for you. So we're already over time and I, and I want to respect everyone's time and probably Simon's breakfast. Um, so I will say thank you very much to, to, to Zhang Hong and to Simon for your time that's been really welcome it, it, it it's I don't know, it, it's an honor to have you here speaking with us we'll put up the recording as quickly as possible um thank you Dan Hong for mentioning your email if that's okay we'll also include that in in the story that goes with it so that people can get in touch and I think certainly if there's a list of countries that are starting to plan their assessments do share and then we'll look to mobilize our libraries and help them to to make the most effective possible contribution to that work. So with that, thank you very much to all of you, to Zhang Hong, to Simon, to Damalari for your time. And I wish you a very good afternoon and rest of the day in your case, Simon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Stephen. Thank you, everybody. Nice to meet you all.